respected brothers and sisters, my elders and learned scholars, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. عظم الله لنا ولكم الأجر بمصاب سيدنا ومولانا أبي عبد الله الحسين عليه السلام الله. Continuing with our discourse, uh, looking with regards to responsibilities of parents and children, and we also spoke about the rights of marriage, and inshallah we will continue that today. Marriage in Islam, as we have already mentioned, takes a great center in the stage of life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed a great emphasis on this concept of marriage because marriage is the very fabric of society. And especially when it comes to consideration of the religion of Islam. We said that every marriage, for the most part, we have seen historically, they always take places in centers of worship. Whether they are Christians, Muslims, Jews, Sikhs, Buddhists, it will always, for the most part, take place in a center of worship. And the reason behind that is because everybody wants their marriage to be blessed by whatever entity they believe in. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes on marriage in the Quran al kareem by attributing it to be one of his greatest signs. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And from the ayat of Allah, from the signs of Allah, is that he has created for you partners. And ja'ala lakum azwaja. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises himself and he says, if you want to see the sign وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ from the ayat of Allah, if you want to see a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and someone said to you, show me that Allah exists, tell them that the institution of marriage is an ayah min ayat Allah. It is a sign from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he has taken care of this institute. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ And he placed between you mawadda and rahmah. That this love which you find between yourself and your partner and this mercy which you find that you have for one another is a divine gift. When someone asks, how is it a divine gift and where is the you know, hand of the Almighty in marriage, in love, in mercy? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to is that he is referring to the laws which he has sent down pertaining to marriage. That is to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the parents their right, the husband his right the wife her right the parents of the wife and the parents of the husband have a right society has a right the whole nikah which is recited has a right the ritual of marriage has a right and the involvement of the almighty in this marriage is a sign of allah's mercy that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say go and marry and you know, by trial and error, you find the right and the wrong way. No. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, since marriage is from my ayat, I will take care of how marriage should be administrated and in which way people should conform to it. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. When we talk about the rights of a woman and the rights of a man in marriage. Unfortunately, and it really is unfortunate, that here in the West, whether it is out of pure ignorance or there is malice intent, the West has, for the most part, misunderstood the concept of marriage in Islam. They attack us in almost every instance on how we conduct our marriage ceremonies. They say that marriage is a trade between two men, the father of the groom and the father of the wife. They come together and they agree this marriage. 
and neither the bride nor the groom have a say in it. Or that the groom has a say in it, but the bride has no say in it. And by here we are alluding to arranged marriages. So they attack arranged marriages and they say that arranged marriages are intrinsically from the faith of Islam. Another way that they attack us is they say that a woman, once she is married, she has no rights. That she must be confined to, you know, domestic issues. That she must remain at home. Another way that they attack Islam, they say that Islam propagates and in fact it has this honor killing system. That if a woman should be unfair to her husband and unfaithful to her husband and commits adultery, then the Muslim people say she must be killed. And this is an honor killing only in the religion of Islam. And they come with all these different, you know, ludicrous, false accusations against the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But unfortunately, because we the Muslims have not taken it upon ourselves to educate ourselves on what Islam really requires of its followers, we become very apologetic. We become very apologetic and we accept what they say as if it is true. As if the Quran has come to say these things. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given authority to these things. And we become very apologetic and we begin to write articles about the civilized Muslims, about the peaceful Muslims. And we say that, oh, you know, this is a back home version of Islam. No. We must come to an understanding that at this present moment, and for the most part in the last century or so, there has become a blurred line between culture and religion. That people have confused the culture and their religion. And as we grow up in life, we see cultural things and we take them to be articles of faith. Sometimes culture can supplement and complement religion. And Amir al-Mu'mineen tells us there is no harm in such culture. As an example, the culture of the Arabs, you find many things which are actually cultural that Islam has accepted and it propagates them. So for example, although Arabia was known as the land of Jahiliya, there was nobody who can compete with the Arabs when it came to Karam, generosity. And nobody who can compete with the Arabs when it came to honoring a guest, the right of a guest. Go to any community, if you go to the Hilton or to the Sheraton, right, they will charge you to stay. To this very day, go to Karbala, the people of Karbala will sleep on their streets so the Zawar of Imam Hussein can sleep in their homes. In Arabia, the people had this sense of generosity where it was customary that when a guest came to their home, for three days this guest, they would feed them, they would take their clothes and wash them, and for three days this guest doesn't need to ask anything. If he says, I've come for a problem, they say, we'll talk about your problem, inshallah, after the period of hospitality has come to an end. For now, you are the guest. And in fact, there is a saying amongst the Arabs that when a guest enters your house, he becomes the owner of the house and you become their guest. The rights and responsibilities that you give to the dhaif, to the guest, that the house becomes theirs and you are a guest in their house. That's the kind of respect that we give. In fact, we even go as far as to say, a dhaif, dhaif Allah. The guest is not my guest. He's the guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as such, we must honor them. These cultural tendencies of honoring people and showing them reverence is not only restricted to the Arab community. In the Indo-Pak community, you will also find these cultural aspects taking place, as well as in Iran, as well as in any part of the world. But Islam says that I will endorse these things. Why? Because they are good qualities. But when culture clashes with religion, and it clashes 
with the norm, then Islam not only does it denounce them, but it tries to slowly and systematically eradicate them. We will inshallah look at an example with the Salat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> In Arabia, slavery was rampant. Slavery, the act of owning a slave, was in fact a way to show social progress. That if I am wealthy, I show my wealth by the amount of slaves that I own. Can you imagine that kind of power? That I have 20 people who will do anything I say and I need not pay them for it because I am their master and they are my slaves. So this was very customary in the Arab world, pre-Islamic era. And in fact, it was something that existed in the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire and in every part of the world. As a matter of fact, linguistics tell us that the first people to ever be enslaved were the people who are known as the Slovaks. And the Slovaks, when they were enslaved, People used to say he is a Slav, as in Slovakian. And that's how the word slave came to existence, that he's a Slav. Slav became slave. So this is something historical. It's not something Islamic. It's not something Arabian. It's not something Persian. It's just human nature. Here in the United States and in the West, slavery only ended less than a century ago, if my historical dates are correct. But we see that until today, the African Americans have had no closure with their previous slave masters. And until today, there are problems in their society. And until today, there are you know, wide and vast gaps between the white Americans and the African Americans. And the reason for this, you know, ill feeling between the two is because slavery was abolished entirely. That means a bunch of people were brought to this continent and then all of a sudden they were told, you're free to go. But go to where? You haven't educated us. You haven't given us any skills in life. We weren't taught to read and write immediately. You know, there was a movement after a movement after, the, you know, after they abolished slavery. Okay. So it wasn't instantaneously that the black people were given their rights. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. Allah, 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 Allah. When slavery was abolished, the African Americans were left to their own devices. And there is still this ill feeling today that they have not had closure and they haven't been given their rights. Islam didn't come to abolish slavery like that. Islam came to, gradual, uh, to, to gradually get rid of slavery. And there is a philosophy in that. Because when we look at Africa as a whole, we find that when, uh, I think it was Mugabe, when he kicked out the white farmers, his country went into turmoil. Why? Because you had power was resting with a particular community and a particular society. And all of a sudden you told this society to pack their bags and to leave. And when they left, they took all the skills of years of administration and left it to people who have no idea how to run the country. And that's not to say that they were incompetent. No, Africa was run by its own people for thousands of years. But you had a number of generations that knew nothing but slavery. All those skills were taken away from them. And their responsibilities were confined to simply farm or to be domestic slaves. A friend of mine in South Africa told me, uh, they call the white people, the, the Danish and the Germans, they call them Boers. Boers means farmers, right? He said when these farmers, you know, when uh, Nelson Mandela came into power, he didn't kick them out because he learned from what happened in the other African countries. He knew that if he kicks them out, South Africa will be in turmoil. So what he then did is he kept these people in power and he brought in employment rights. 
And he said that the white people must remain, but they must train African people on how to administrate the affairs. And within three to four generations, everything, power will be slowly given back to the people of South Africa. He said the reason is because a black man in Africa may know how to farm a land, but the white man, he knows by the signs in the wind and by looking at the color of the leaves, when to plant and when to harvest. He has the administrative skills, and that's what the people were lacking. When Rasulullah and Islam came to get rid of slavery, they didn't say the black people are just free to go. No, it came through social reform. And the first of the social reform is that Rasulullah wanted to get rid of the connotations that were used when referring to black people. In Arabia, you know, here we have the N-word, which is still in use today in the most derogatory term. And even, you know, African Americans use it against their own African Americans. And that word, you can still see that there is an ill feeling attached to it. In Arabia, the equivalent of the N-word was the word Abd. Abd meant slave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Prophet to get rid of this word slave and all the ill feelings that were connected to it through the thousands of years of slavery, he commanded everybody who believes in Allah to say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. that I testify Allah is my Lord and Muhammad is a slave and the messenger of Allah. The word Abd was preferred to the word Nabi. The word Abd was given a higher status than Rasul. So now if anybody walked in the streets and they saw a black person and they said, Ya Abd, this black person will no longer feel subjugated to any kind of insult because they will feel proud. They say, yes, I am a Abd, but Muhammad is also a Abd. I am a Abd. Zakariya in the Quran, Allah says, Zakariya is Abdullah. I am a Abd. Every Nabi of Allah was also a Abd. So you have given me the greatest of titles. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. In this method, Islam came to slowly, not just to change the status of the people in society, but to change the hearts and the minds of the people and the approach of people to cultural norms. So therefore, when you see in the Quran al-Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if your wife doesn't listen to you and your wife doesn't obey you and your wife was unfaithful to you, then hit her. You have to understand it in the social context that it came. That time in Arabia, people used to bury their daughters just for the fact that they were women. You had a lifestyle that said, if she is born a woman, I have every right to bury her because she is a source of shame unto me. The Quran comes to reform that mentality. The Quran says, first of all, advise her. Really? You come to Arabian arrogance and you tell a man, your wife didn't listen to you. In those days, if your wife didn't listen to you, she became wajib al-qatl. Not her father, not her brother, not her son. Nobody would speak up for the woman in Arabia. Women had no rights. And Islam comes to these arrogant Arabian men full of ego and the Quran says to them, if your wife done something wrong, فَعِيضُهُنَّ Advise them. Sincere advice. And if advising them doesn't work, you know, leave your bed for a while. Leave your bed. And don't share the same room. What do psychologists tell us today? If you're having problems with your partner, what do you do? You know, we need some me time. We need a break from each other. I need my own space. Isn't that what psychologists tell us today? 
The best of those who give counsel today for marriage counsel, those who take thousands of dollars to save a marriage, the first thing they will tell you is, you know, you should have some downtime from each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell us that in the Quran from 1,400 years ago for free. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you know, have some downtime. Before we continue, if I can ask you one more time to please move forward as we have more people coming back. Qad aflaha man salla ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us after that, he says, now, even if nothing has worked and you feel that you must hit her, then do so. But with conditions, with conditions. Someone came to Rasulullah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to hit my wife because everything I've tried in the Quran is not working. Again, you're talking to a, a mentality at that age, right? So Rasulullah said, fine, you know. If you're going to, then know the limits of Allah. Rasulullah didn't say just hit her. He said, know the limits of Allah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, and what are the limits of Allah? He said that you get like twigs, thin twigs, and you gently strike her. And if you leave any mark on her body, then you must pay kafara. He said, Ya Rasulullah, so what's the point of hitting her? You see, there is no point in hitting her in Islam. What Islam is trying to do is to change the social status of man in regards to how he treats a woman. Those who are true Muslimin and true Arifin and have studied the religion of Islam and understood it, they understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means when, it, when he says, فَضْرِبُوهُنَّ There is a scholar in Qum, and he wrote books on the rights of women. And the name, unfortunately, you know, it's escaped my mind. But this scholar in Qum, when he wrote books on how to treat your wife, his wife would read his books. And, you know, his wife wanted to know, is this guy just talking nonsense? Or is he really going to practice what he preaches? And in his book, he kept on saying that you are not allowed to hit the women. Because although the Quran has said something, we must look at the sunnah of Rasulullah. And we have no hadith that Rasulullah or Amir al-Mu'mineen or Hassan al-Mujtaba or Sayyid al-Shuhada or Zainul al-Abideen or Imam Baqir or Sadiq al-Ilm or Musa al-Kazim. None of the imams from the first of them to the last, we do not have a tradition that says they even swore at their wives, let alone raise their hands at their wives. And the Quran doesn't require my tafsir and your tafsir. Ahlul Bayt are the tafsir and the ta'wil of the Quran al kareem In the battle of Safin, Muawiyah al-Anatullah alayhi places the Quran on the spears. And he elevates this Quran on the spears to tell the people, oh, I'm a Muslim. There is a narration agreed upon both by the Sunnis and the Shia. Sa'ir al-Muslimin. All the Muslimin agree that the moment the Quran was raised on the spear, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam Allah said, By Allah, that Quran is silent. وَأَنَا الْقُرْآنُ nātiq. When Imam Ali said, that Quran is silent and I am the eloquent Quran, all the pages of the Quran fell to the floor immediately as if to accept the statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Muhammad. <laughs> so when we look at Islam, we shouldn't leave the Quran to be translated. You know, if I were to give you a Bible or a Torah, <coughs> and I said to you, you know, you're a Muslim, here's the Bible, translate it for me. Write about the Bible, and you came back and you said, and you know what, there are violent verses in the Bible. There are. There are verses in the Bible that are violent, right? If you were to take them at face value without understanding their context. And there are verses in the Torah that call for war, right? And again, you can say they are violent, okay? 
But that is for me reading them and I do not understand their historical context. And I give the Torah or the Injil or the you know, Psalms of David or the book of the Sikhs or the book of the Hindus or the Buddhists. And I give it to a Muslim scholar and I say, here, translate it. And this Muslim scholar comes back and he says, this religion is a religion of extremism. It is a religion of violence. It is a religion that degrades the women. Do you think the Christian people will believe what he says? No. Why? Because you're not an authority. You are not a Christian. So therefore you do not have the authority to write on the Bible. You can give an opinion, but you cannot pass it as conclusive evidence. You can give your opinion on the Torah, but you're not a Jew. You didn't grow up with that discourse and the history and the stories that are not found in the Torah. The stories about Musa and Isa, Jesus, son of Mary, that are not available in the Bible and the Torah, but they are found amongst the adherents of that faith. When you miss that narrative, you cannot do justice to the scriptures of those faith. Likewise, we cannot ask a Christian to tell us whether my religion is peaceful, or a Jew, or an atheist, or anyone who doesn't understand Ahlul Bayt. Those people, as sincere as they may be, and I take nothing away from them from their efforts, as sincere as they may be when they approach the Quran, they will not be able to do justice to the Quran al Kareem because they missed out on the entire narrative of Ahlul Bayt. Inni Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun Babuha. Rasulullah says, I am the kingdom of knowledge. And Ali is the door of that kingdom. So anybody who comes and approaches the Quran to understand it without understanding Ali ibn Abi Talib, they have nothing of the Quran but the linguistics. <coughs> the Quran now tells us one thing and the Ahlul Bayt show us the implication of the Quran. And coming back to our point that the Quran was slowly and gradually trying to change the minds of the people, the men, with regards to the women of the community. Where one day the woman is being placed six feet underground as a corpse, the next day Rasulullah says, the woman that was beneath your feet, paradise is beneath her feet. Imagine that status. A woman who was forced into marriage to be bought and sold, Islam tells us, and those of you who understand marriage, you know that a marriage cannot take place without vows. Unlike any other religion on the face of the earth, Islam is the only religion that says the vows begin with the woman. So I can put a gun to a woman's head and say, marry me, but she refuses to recite the vows, then it's not marriage. The vows of marriage in Islam begin with the woman. Zawajtuka nafsi. When we look at the linguistics, it's not my father married me to you. No. Zawajtuka. I give myself to you in marriage. Absolute independence for the woman. I give myself. Not my father. Not my community. Not some maulana. Nobody, I give myself to you in marriage. And I give myself to you in marriage on the basis that my dowry should be such and such. Not my father who agrees how much you should give in dowry. Dowry, in fact, in Islam doesn't go to the parents. It is the absolute and exclusive right of the woman. So for those who have come and misunderstood Islam and say, oh, in Islam... Men buy women from their families. No. Imagine, and, and this is a reality. Imagine if right now in the West, everybody was to apply just the concept of dowry before relationship. How many relationships outside of marriage do you think will happen? Because, you know, if I'm just dating, I'm getting everything from a woman. And maybe she's getting everything from me. 
but I'm not spending a penny. But now imagine every time I want to date a woman and I say, I'd like to take you on a date. She says, yes, but as a woman, God has given me rights. And I say, okay, and I will give you your divine rights. And she says, my right is to choose a dowry. Not I choose a dowry, she chooses a dowry. She puts a price on herself. Not me, not you, not her father. And I say, okay, and what do you value yourself at? And she said, I value myself at $30,000. That you must give me $30,000 before you even touch a hair of my head. How many relationships do you think you're going to have before you're married? You know what? You're going to give more respect to that woman because you're going to say, you know what? If I'm spending that much, I may as well get every penny's worth. This is going to be for life. This is a relationship that's going to be for life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to remove this ill approach towards women that we can see rampant in society today. That she must have curves in all the right places. Believe me, some people may take offense that I'm speaking in this way on the member of Rasulullah, but I'm not. And I don't mean it as offense because this is what's happening in our societies. And this member was only made to address the illnesses of our society. Otherwise, it's nothing more or less than rituals. So please take no offense, and I mean no disregard to the member of Imam Hussein, but I'd rather not beat around the bush and speak it as it is. So sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> On the other front, you have the case of divorce. But before we even look at divorce, let's look at what Islam talks about, marriage. The first thing we said is that Allah tells us marriage is from his signs. How is it from his signs? Because he has placed laws around marriage to administrate it. The second thing he says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he placed between you love and mercy. But what kind of love did Allah place between myself and my wife? It's not mahabba. In Arabic, mahabba means love. In the indo pak you say, pyar ho gaya. Right? Allah didn't say mahabba. He said mawadda. And I'm speaking to my Shia brothers here. Where else do we find in the Quran that Allah has commanded us to show mawadda? To the family of the Prophet. So Allah is telling you in effect... When you are married, you become part of the family of Rasulullah. When you are married, you must treat your wife with the same level of respect that you treat the family of your Prophet. That the husband must treat the wife with the respect he gives to the family of the Prophet. And the wife must treat the husband with the respect that they give to the Prophet. And here I mean the divine respect. It's not a matter of authority, it's a matter of divine respect. Mawadda means to love someone in such a way that they will have no other option but to love you back. It's a give and take relationship. Mawadda is to love someone in such a way that they will love you back. And this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses Mawadda when he talks about Ahlul Bayt. And inshallah, I will get to that point. When I love a woman, and I don't mean me personally, but I mean we, the collective us, or a woman loves a man, what do we do? We begin to copy the things that they love. We begin to take interest in the things that they like. Why? Because you want to get their attention. You want to have something in common. I know a girl likes flowers. You ask any guy, do you like flowers? They will laugh at you. But, you know, on Valentine's Day, we run around with our hoodies and we buy flowers and we hide them in the boot of our vehicle. And, you know, we hope to God that nobody saw us giving our Valentine a flower, right? But she's expecting a flower. Your wife, your fiancé, even your mother. There's no harm in showing love to your parents. But you want to express your love. 
You don't just say, I love you, and you leave it there. You express your love. You know that your wife-to-be is into chick flicks, so you start to watch, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. So you've got something, a meaningful conversation going on. And likewise, maybe she'll get into the same soccer team, basketball team, football team, whatever it is that you're into. And that's how relationships work in general. Mawadda means to love that which others love so that in doing so, they love me back. The reason why Allah commands us to show mawadda to Ahlul Bayt, Allah says, love Ali ibn Abi Talib. But love Ali in such a way that Ali will love you back. Okay, so now I want Ali ibn Abi Talib to love me back. I start to look at the things that Ali ibn Abi Talib loves. Ali loves salah and he never misses it. Ali prays his salah on time. Ali loves honesty and he hates liars. Ali loves truth and he hates falsehood. Ali loved helping the orphans and he hated to brush shoulders with the rich and the arrogant. Rich, fine, but rich and arrogant, Ali did not like. Ali loved the oppressed people and championed their cause and he hate every tyrant and every arrogant individual. If I want Ali to love me back, I pray on time. If I want Ali to love me back, I help the orphans. If I want Ali to love me back, I do not discriminate between Christian, Jew, Muslim, black, white, Hindu, human, animal and plant. I treat all of God's creation equally and when I I can begin to do that, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I love you because you love that which I love. Hussein ibn Ali gave his entire family for justice. He sacrificed each and every member of his household for truth. When people said to him, Imam Hussein, why do you go to Karbala with your family? He said, do you not see that people no longer adhere to truth and people follow falsehood? Do you not see that the rights of the weak are being trampled on and that people no longer care for religion and a religious way of life and people no longer care to be God-fearing? And that the, the rule today is the rule of kings and tyrants. Such a life is not pleasing to me. By God, Death is more honorable to me because I would rather be in the realm of a king who does no injustice to his subjects than live under kings who are nothing but tyrants and oppressors. When I love justice and I love freedom for everybody, then Imam Hussein Allah can love me. Allah says, I have placed such kind of love between you and your spouse, your partners in life. Those who come forward and say Islam knows nothing about love, they have nothing to do with love. Because they are coming to Islam with Romeo and Juliet, a kind of love that tells me to despair, to be hopeless, to commit suicide when things aren't working my way. Islam tells me no, love somebody in such a way that even when you have no reason to love them, you still try hard to make that relationship work because it is God who puts you together. This is the concept of marriage in Islam. Marriage in Islam is such a holy thing that Allah said it is half of your faith. Pray all you want, fast all you want. Struggle in the way of your Lord all you want. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if he is teasing us so that we can desire marriage through the lips of his holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. He tells us one prayer of a married man reaps the reward of 70 times that of an unmarried man. One prayer of a married man reaps the reward 70 times of an unmarried man. When I think about my wife, or the wife thinks about her husband, you have to really give them the utmost respect. Because this is an individual who is like a perk 
They're like a bonus to your worship. Every act of worship you do, because of them it is being multiplied. So therefore, should you not treat that person kindly? If I am aspiring to be in paradise, and I know that the currency of the Lord is good deeds, and I have a person who's multiplying these good deeds, should I not be kind to them? Let me give you an example. I come to your house every morning and I drop you $70 for no reason. $70, no reason whatsoever. I'm giving you wealth in this world. How will you treat me? I'm sure you will not be rude to me. I'm sure you will not want to upset me because you're afraid. Maybe you don't love me, but you're afraid. If I annoy this guy tomorrow, I ain't getting nothing. Right? So then how should you treat your wife or your husband? Knowing that in the akhirah, for every time you pray, it multiplies by 70. And the moment I lose this person, I'm going to lose those bonuses. Divorce, unfortunately, has become rampant in this day and age. Not only amongst the West, but even amongst the Muslimin. Divorce is what Rasulullah tells us. Of all the things that the Lord has made permissible, divorce is the thing that he hates the most. When a man divorces his wife, the throne of the Almighty trembles in rage. Why? Because you broke up a family. Because now there will be children growing up in a society where people will mock them and say, huh, your mom got divorced. Your dad got divorced. Your mom must have been a bad person. Oh, your dad's not around to pick you up? So divorce is disliked by the Lord because it puts hatred in the hearts of people. It ruins the name of people. This woman who one day was held in high esteem in her society, now people see her as a divorcee. And as a divorcee to her face, people are nice. But behind her back, Everyone's saying it must have been her fault. And that shows you that as a people, we haven't learned anything from Islam. Islam that came to change the status of a woman, to this day, whenever there's a divorce, nobody would say there was something wrong in the man. Everyone would say there was something wrong in the woman. Automatically. Automatically. A woman that's divorced, people will say, well, there must have been something wrong with her. Which shows you our mentality and how far we are from Islam. Let's go back to that concept of hitting the wife and what this scholar who I mentioned in Qom, what he wrote about marriage and how he conducted himself. You know, sometimes people think because their wife annoys them, it's reason for divorce. No. Your wife is supposed to annoy you. Why do you think God gives you so many rewards? It's for your patience. Imam Ali says, marriage is half your deen. What's the other half? Patience. Your husband is supposed to give you a headache. Otherwise, he wouldn't be your husband. Just the same way that our children give us a hard time, do we give up on them? No. You can't give up on your children because they give you a hard time. In Sahih Bukhari and the Quran even tells us, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When two of the wives of Rasulullah conspired behind his back. The Quran says, not me, not you. Two of the wives of the Prophet conspired behind his back. When Rasulullah entrusted a secret to one and she told it to the other. Then Allah continues to say how the Prophet should practice patience with them. Then Allah says, O wives of the Prophet. If you do not behave yourselves, then Allah will divorce you from Rasulullah. Why did Allah say Allah will divorce you, not the Prophet? Because divorce is unliked. And Allah says, my Prophet does nothing that is unliked. So therefore, I will be the one to get him out of this problem. But even then, when we look how much Rasulullah struggled with these two wives, at the end, he did not divorce them. Why? Because you're supposed to be patient forbearance this ustad the scholar in qom his wife wanted to annoy him she said i want to know do i have a diamond do i have a gem or do i have a parrot you know he's just good at talking let me see the patience of this husband 
Because if he can do what he says, then I should start giving the book out to other women. So she came up to him and, you know, she started to annoy him. And he would say, may Allah forgive you. And she keeps annoying him. He says, may Allah forgive you. So one day she really, you know, men, no matter how religious you are, you have that sensitive nerve. When your manhood is challenged, there's that sensitive nerve. She said, when will you hit me? He said, never. She said, I know. He said, really? Do you know my iman that much? She said, no. You're just not man enough. You're not man enough to hit me. She said, if you were a real man, and she's talking the cultural values. She said, if you were a real man, for the hell that I've put you through, and the insults that I have sent against you, and the way I disrespect you in the community, if you were a man, you would have wiped the floor clean with me a very long time ago. But you know what? And by the way, she's Iranian. And Iranian women, we know, they're quite strong, right? She said, but if you were a man, if you had namus, you would have put me in my place a long time ago, but I'm married to a child. So he gets angry. He says to her, you know what? I'm going to mosque, and by Allah, when I come back, I will show you exactly what kind of man I am. This lady who narrates the story, poor thing, when the husband's gone, she starts praying, oh God, what have I put myself into? Should I open the door? Should I not open the door? How am I going to confront him? So when he comes home, she opens the door. She opens the door. Maulana pulls out a bouquet of roses and taps her on the face. She said, what was that for? He said, in Islam, Rasulullah told me that even when you hate, hate with love. That if I'm going to hit my wife, I will hit you with love. I have nothing but love to give for you. I'm not loving you because I'm expecting you to love me back. I'm loving you because God expects love from me towards you. And likewise, as my wife, you should love me not because I'm worthy of love, but because God expects it from you. But because you are a good person, you have love to give, so you give love. In today's society, we have become so self-centered. A husband wants to be babysat by his wife. And the wife wants a husband to babysit. That, oh, the moment I'm not happy emotionally, then this relationship isn't working. If we are supposed to be happy 24 hours a day in our life, then believe me, God wouldn't have made earth. We would have remained in heaven. But this world is a test, and marriage is a test. And it is the times when you are confronted with those difficult moments, and you have no reason to love someone, and you still turn around and say to them, I forgive you, even though you have wronged me, but I forgive you because I love you, and I love you because God expects it from me. That's the true concept of Islamic love. Love and marriage are two things that are norm in Islam. And inshallah, we will conclude in the last 10 minutes by talking about the status of love in today's society. In today's society, marriage has become a status of success. And this is unfortunate. Rather than marriage... Before we continue, if we can ask everybody to move forward, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Marriage today is placed as the last standard of success. <clears throat> that first in the line of success comes my graduation from high school, from university. I get my master's, I get my PhD. And once I've got that, then I must get a job in a respectable company. And I've got, you know, the thousands and upon thousands in my bank account. And once I've got my fancy bank account, then I go and buy the nice big house. 
And after I've bought the big house, after I've put down a down payment on a mortgage, I need to save up tens and tens of thousands so on the wedding day I can have a nice beautiful chandelier that nobody even noticed because they were too busy looking at the cake. Right? After all of this, then I can get married. And may God help you when it comes to finding a wife in the halal way. Because you see, as a human being, let us speak frankly, if you didn't have tons of relationships before the age of, because by the time you've achieved all these things, I mean, it's a process, right? You can't graduate, unless you're Einstein, you can't graduate from med school until you're what, 25, 26, 27, okay? By the time you get your two years residency, you're 28, 29. By the time you've got a job, you're 30. By the time you've got your savings and your house, no, 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 no. You're 35. Are you telling me in America, you're not living in Qom, you're not living in Mecca, you're not living in a place where there is hijab and everything. You're living in the US where everything is available. Relationships come to you if you don't go to them. Are you telling me you're that religious that before the age of 35 you don't have so many haram relationships? Realistically, be honest with yourself. You don't get into those haram relationships and the reason you delay marriage is because marriage will be a hindrance to my success in the dunya. How ignorant are we? You are ready to put and jeopardize your akhirah for your dunya. You are ready to commit adultery and God knows how many other haram relationships will be written on your book because you want to have a fancy chandelier in your wedding but you're not thinking about Jahannam. Rasulullah tells us it is better for the sons of Adam that they have a nail hammered into the center of their forehead and not touch the palm of a woman whom God has not made permissible to them. Yet we tell our children and our children tell themselves, let's delay marriage. Let's delay marriage because marriage will be a hindrance. Listen, I don't have kids and God knows I've tried to get married. It's just not working. You know, I travel, alhamdulillah, and I've been given an option. Drop out of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salamullah, or, you know, just stay single until I find someone who's willing to be a gypsy like me, right? But that's a point for another day. The main point here is this, that if I had children, I'm thinking as a parent, because I've got nephews and I understand parenthood, and my child, mashallah, boy, girl, whatever they are, I have a bedroom for them and I feed them three times a day, five times a day, depending on their habits. And I've been doing that for the last 15 years and I've put them through school and high school and, and you know, university. Up until now, they don't need to leave home. Who's looking after them, me or themselves? Me, correct? Let me ask you, if I bring one extra mouth into my house, one extra person, how much more do I need to pay? I mean, my child already has their bedroom. At best, if they have a single bed, take it out, bring them a king-size bed. You and your wife, or the wife and her husband. I'm, I'm more than willing, if I have a daughter, to adopt my son-in-law, because he is my son in Islam. Rasulullah adopted Ali ibn Abi Talib. Let no man think it a shameful thing that he should get help from his father-in-law. No. You are not more not honorable than Ali ibn Abi Talib. Right? Why, what is stopping me from making my children get married at a young age? Or at least be engaged at a young age? Okay, they're going to go to school, to university. Brothers, don't lie to yourself because you're definitely not lying to me. And sisters, don't lie to yourself because you're not lying to me. I've been there, done that, I've been through the school system. The biggest distraction to every guy and girl in school is relationships. Because you're constantly thinking, what do they think about me? Have I got their eye? Have I not got their eye? What's the problem in my son 
or my daughter and their partner, husband or wife, they're going to go to school. Habibi, I'm going to pay for their uni dorms anyway. And for those of you who've been to university, you know what kind of haram happens at university, right? We're not judging any society, but we have our values, right? From the alcohol to the drug to the late night parties. Tell me, what is the surest way to make sure your son or your daughter is not going to get up to any mischief? Because my son is not coming home drunk if his wife is there. That's for sure. And my son is not going to be going to parties if his wife is there in the same school studying with him. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I know of two individuals in London who were married before they were 18. They went to college, to university, and now, alhamdulillah, they are in Hausa studying together and they've had their first child. And it's a, it is a beautiful relationship. Because you know why? When you're married at the age of 35, realistically, what history do you have to share with your wife? Everything, the youth, the prime of your life, the best times in your life were wasted on others, on regretful relationships. Why not utilize that experience and have that? I mean, listen, when I talk to my parents, my parents were married at the age of 18. They have history. Good and bad, they have history. If I'm 40 and my wife is 40, by the time we're dead, we're 50, what history did we share? Nothing. Nothing. So there is no harm. There is only cultural taboos and stigmas that prevent us from getting married at a young age. And we will find excuses. We will lie to ourselves. Oh, it's difficult. Why? Because we want to get up to mischief. Human tendencies. The reason why I say this is because, you know, when I look at the life of the shuhada of Karbala, Al Qasim ibn al Hassan alayhi salam, Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa We hear that Qasim was married the day of or the night of Ashura. And, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm a thinker. I don't just consume, I criticize. So when I used to hear this wedding of Qasim, you know, he's a 12-year-old youth, and tomorrow he knows he will die for sure. His uncle Imam Hussein knows he will die for sure. Ashura is about to happen. The entire khayma of Imam Hussein is mourning and grieving. And yet we are told that Imam Hussein recites the nikah of Qasim, the marriage vows between his nephew and one of his daughters. So when I was in Iran, I asked one of the marja'iyah there, I said, you know, I disagree with this story, and I think it's a fabrication, and I don't see any sense in it. Because for me, logically, it doesn't make sense. He said, number one, I commend you for being able to, you know, think about the situation, but let me show you a side of the story that you missed. And this is why we must give our marja'iyah the utmost respect. Because they see things that we don't see. He said, is marriage not half your deen? I said, of course. It is half your deen. No Muslim disputes that it is half your faith. He said, okay. And did Rasulullah not say that whomever wants to meet Allah in the best of ways, let them meet them while they have their partners with them. That means if a woman wants to be in the best position with Allah, let her come to him with a husband. And a husband should come with a wife on the day of judgment. I said, yes, that is true. He said, do you think Imam Hussein would like that people will say his nephew and the son of his brother Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba died while half his deen was not complete? Do you think Imam Hussein wants to deny Imam Hassan's son the lofty status and honor of standing before Allah in the best of esteemed positions along with his wife? That is why Imam Hussein made Al Qasim alayhi salam Allah recite his nikah on the night of Ashura because it is the completion of faith. 
Imam was trying to make a statement to you and to me that marriage is so important, even if you know for certain death awaits you, rush towards marriage. Who can guarantee themselves that they will not die tomorrow? Who can guarantee themselves that they will not die the moment they leave? Rasulullah looked at one of his companions and he said to him, how do you perceive death? He said, I perceive death that I am not sure if I sleep, whether I will wake up or not. Rasulullah said, oh my God, how far do you see death? He said, Rasulullah, what do you mean far? I'm saying if I sleep, I don't know if I will wake up. Rasulullah said, no, you should see death that when you take a breath in, you don't know if you're going to breathe out. That's how sudden death can come to us. How many young lives were snatched on the highways in a car accident? How many young lives, you know, especially with Ebola at the moment going around, how do you know you won't catch it? May we, may we not catch it? Amen to that. But how do you know? So when the reward of marriage is so great, why do we delay from it? And this is why Imam Hussein alayhi salam Allah, in Karbala, don't tell yourself you're in the West. The West is not more difficult than Karbala. Don't tell yourself you have difficulties. Your difficulties were not death. With all the trials and tribulations that were facing Ahlul Bayt, Imam Hussein wanted Qasim ibn al Hassan to complete his deen with marriage. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Let us dim out the lights and recollect those heart rendering memories of how a young and valiant and a noble warrior at the age of 12 came forward on that day and offered to give his life for the emancipation of humanity at that day and age from the shackles and chains of ignorance and absolute oppression. Al Qasim ibn al Hassan alayhi salam. In Arabic we say Lam yablug al -hilm. In English that means he did not even reach the age of puberty. That's how young Al Qasim alayhi salam was. When his uncle Imam Hussein came to him and he said to him, Qasim, my dear nephew, how do you see death? Qasim responds to Imam Hussein alayhi salam Allah. He says, O oh, uncle, to die for your cause. And what is the cause of Imam Hussein? Emancipation of humanity from the chains of ignorance. To die for your cause, death is sweeter than honey to me. Ibrahim asked Ismail, his son, how do you see death? He said, O oh, Father, do as you have been commanded. I pray that I shall be patient. Patience means that you dislike something, but yet you will endure. But Qasim alayhi salam Allah did not say, I will be patient. He said, death for you, O oh, uncle, is sweeter than honey. I ask permission from an imam who is mazloom and oppressed and ignored by friends and by his enemies, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba. I ask him permission as I relate to you the tragic story of how his son made him proud on the day of Ashura. When Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam and Aun and Muhammad and the family of Imam Hussein went out and gave their lives. The narrations and the historical accounts tell us that at that moment Imam Hussein was left with only two, if not three people. Abbas ibn Ali, Al Qasim ibn al Hassan, and his beloved infant child, Abdullah al Radi', also known as Ali al Asqar. Imagine you are standing in the heat of Karbala, three days without water. 
And since your day began until now, all you've been doing is going back and forth, picking up the mutilated bodies of your friends, of your son, of your nephews. And you know soon your sisters will be taken into captivity and your sisters will be paraded from one place to another, made mockery of. And you know that nothing awaits you but certain death. How great must your sorrow be? So Imam Hussein called out, Wa dhullata. Oh, what a humiliating state it is for us, Ahlul Bayt, that I have 35,000 enemies and I only have three companions remaining. Is there no one to hear my call for help and they come to give me their help? Is there no one to have pity on my situation and come to my aid? Is there nobody who knows my status and comes to honor me? At that moment, a 12-year-old came out of the tent running towards Imam Hussein. He threw himself at the feet of his uncle, saying, Uncle Hussein, how can you utter such words while I am still alive and in the camp waiting to give my life for you? Imam Hussein looked at Qasim. He took Qasim in his embrace. He smelled the fragrance of Qasim. He said, Qasim, I cannot permit you to go. Imam Qasim said, my uncle, why? He said, Qasim, every time I look at you, I see my brother Hassan al-Mujtaba. Every time I look at you I remember my childhood with my older brother every time I look at you I remember the greatness of the sorrow at the time the way your father was killed so therefore I cannot let you go Qasim was heartbroken he went to his mother he said mother is there no way that you can help me she said and how can I help you my son he said mother did my father not leave anything for me on this day is there not a will that he has left for me on this day I am asking my uncle to let me fight for him but he refuses to let me fight for him his mother brings out a small box in that box there are the belongings of his father she opens the box there is the turban of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba there is the armor of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba there are two letters there written by the hand of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba the first of them is written to my beloved son Qasim and the second one addressed to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Imagine yourself, you are a child, an orphan, your father has left this world and this is the first time you see a written letter from him. Imam Qasim, in a world turbulent with emotions, he opens the letter, tears streaming from his eye. He reads, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My dear son Qasim, if you are reading this letter, then I know for certain you are in Karbala and I also know that your uncle Hussein is left without no helper. Qasim had it not been for the promise of death, I would be in Karbala the first one to defend my brother Hussein. My dear Qasim make your father proud on this day. Do not abandon your uncle. Qasim begins to kiss this letter. Why? Because it is his ijazah, it is his permission, it is what he has desired. He runs to Abba Abdullah. The narration say that he ran so fast to his uncle that he was tripping and falling as he went to Imam Hussein he gives the letter to Imam Hussein Imam Hussein opens the letter and he says Aba Abdullah I am your brother Hassan al-Mujtaba I have never once asked you for anything in our lifetime but in my death I ask you for one thing do not shame me before our mother Fatima Zahra let it not be said that your children died and my children outlived them Aba Abdullah, accept my Qasim as the Qurban. Imam Hussein embraced Qasim. What a difficult embrace. He put the Imam on his head. He put the turban on his head. He adorned him with the armor. Then he told Qasim, go forth, my beloved nephew. Go forth, oh my Qasim. They say that when Qasim alayhi salam entered the Maidan, the enemies began to laugh. Why? Because they saw or a young child, a young child at the age of 12 approaching them. 
Nobody believed that he was able to fight. They began to make mockery of Qasim. So his response to them was, do not make mockery of my youth. For my father was a youth in Badr, and Uhud and Hunayn. I am the grandson of Abel Hasnain. If you deny me, I am the son of Hassan al-Mujtaba. I will not remain here silently. I see the wolves of war have surrounded my uncle. So if you wish to get to Hussein, by Allah, you must get to me first. The narration tells us that he felled them by his sword in their hundreds until one man approached Al-Qasim alayhi salam. He was counted by a thousand warriors. These people came to Al-Qasim. They offered him a jewel. He was striking them down one by one until his sandal broke. In the Arab warfare, a warrior, if his sandal breaks, he must fix his sandal. If he doesn't, he is considered a coward. Here is Hassan, the son of Imam Hassan, 12 years old, showing his valor and his championship. When his sandal broke, Ajrukum Allah, he bent down to fix the sandal. Omar bin Saad said to one of his soldiers, I want you to break the heart of Imam Hussein. He said, how? He said, attack the child when he is not looking. When Qasim went down to fix his sandal, Ajrukum Allah, they raised the sword. They struck him on his head. He fell to the ground. The horses began to trample on the body of Al Qasim. Everyone in Karbala, when they fell, they cried out, Imam Hussein, alayka minni salam, except for Qasim ibn al Hassan. He was feeling so much pain that he's the only one who said, Uncle Hussein, come save me from what they are doing to me. <laughs> Imam Hussein came to Al Qasim ibn al Hassan. His reply was, My dear Qasim, it is difficult that you call me and I cannot come to you, or that I come to you but I cannot give you help, or I give you help but I cannot ward off death from you. Qasim, may Allah curse a nation that killed you. He carried him, he took him back to the Khaymah, he placed him between Aun and Muhammad and Ali al Akbar. Then he came when he went in. They say that Zainab al Kubra saw Imam Hussein. She saw the state of Imam Hussein. Mu'mineen and Mu'minat, Ajrukum ala Allah. Al Qasim was 12. Imam Hussein was a grown man. Yet when he was carrying Qasim, the feet of Qasim were dragging on the floor. Do you know why the feet of Qasim were dragging on the floor? Because Imam Hussein could not stand up straight. He felt defeated at the death of Qasim. When Zainab saw this, she ran in the Khaymah. She went to see Imam Hussein to give him comfort, to give him support. Zainab says, when I came into the Khaymah, I looked to my right, I looked to my left, and I couldn't see Imam Hussein. I thought to myself, he just went into the Khaymah. She says, when I wiped away my tears and my sight returned to me, I saw Imam Hussein laying down on the ground. He one hand on Qasim, the other on Ali al-Akbar. And he was crying, saying, oh the youth, oh the youth, why should you sleep so long? Imam Hussein Zainab said to him, Aba Abdullah, I want you to give a moment. Umm Farwa Ramla, the mother of Qasim, wants to bid farewell to him. They say that his mother came in. Imagine a mother, instead of seeing the wedding of her son, instead of seeing the mendy of her son, instead her hands turn red with the blood of her son. She holds him, she places him in her lap. She tells him, Ya Qasim, wala mal. No wealth, no wealth. Oh, Qasim, I wanted you. I didn't want wealth from this world. No wealth, oh, Qasim, I wanted you to be there for me on my old age. No wealth, oh, Qasim, Karbala took you from me. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب 
سينقلبون إليه وسيد ومولاي نقسم عليك باسم القاسم الشهيد باسم الحسن المجتبى يا الله أو الله we beseech you make our youth firm in their faith make them firm in their determination to help their community to help their society make them be like the champions of Karbala those who do not discriminate based on faith based on gender based on race those who are ready to render service to humanity because ultimately this is the message of Imam Hussein. Oh Allah, we pray to you by the Mazlum of Karbala, by the oppressed one in Karbala, to remove all oppression from all the people, especially Sheikh Nimr. Oh Allah, we beseech you to return him to his family, safe and sound, in one piece, healthy, living, alive, and a benefit to his community. Ilahi, we pray to you if there are students and youth here who are sitting exams, make them successful in their exams and give them all that they desire of the legitimate desires in this world and safeguard them from all the ills of this world so that when they meet you in the hereafter, they meet you as the best of people. Let us remember those who have passed away, those who are not here with us in person, but are with us in spirit. Let us remember those who have made this majlis possible. And their marhumin and our marhumin with the Surah al Mubarak al Fatiha, with the Salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum ya Abba Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum ya Ibn Rasulullah. السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعل الله آخر الأهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات